Well, a very warm welcome to you all. I think the emphasis might be on warm. It is incredibly warm in here. Um, my name is Karen Daly, and I have the pleasure in this last slot to go through the social um, media um, employment implications. And um, there's some really good stuff in here. And, um, and I think you'll find it very interesting. Um, and I think it gives you a real insight into um, a kind of the mad world of people's brains. Um, in Ireland, we've got this saying, um, which is, there's an out as queer as folk. And I think this very much, this slot will just show you that people just say and just do the maddest things. So I'm going to cover the perils of social media, and it truly is perilous. Um, and I've got some real shockers in here that I'm going to share with you. A what's up with uh, WhatsApp. Um, and then rather than just leaving you with all the problems, um, hopefully some solutions to just point you in the right direction um, if you um, think that there's some issues back at, back at work. Um, before I progress, I've actually got a confession to make to you. Um, I have very limited use of social media uh, for various reasons, and I'm not going to mention them. Um, I do use WhatsApp, but I just use it for my family, and it just tends to be little emojis and how are you and can I call you and stuff like that. I don't really discuss things. Um, and I really enjoyed it during lockdown because I'd send li little funny gifts and stuff like that. Um, and then I uh, have a WhatsApp group for my neighbours, and that's usually generally what colour bin do we have to put out. So it's very much anodyne kind of stuff. So I'm really shocked when I've seen all of the stuff that's put on social media. Um, and as I was preparing for this um, 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 talk, it made me think about um, two things. One is, have you ever sat in a meeting and someone has said something and you've looked at them, you're just thinking, I know that might have come into your head, but you do realize you actually said it. <laughs> and I think it's a little bit like that with social media. Um, people think the maddest things and then they decide to just tell the world about it. And you're thinking it might have been a really good idea for it to have stayed in your brain or perhaps maybe even not have those views. <laughs> the, the other thing that I wanted to share with you as well, and I know this is going to be difficult in a big room and I should, probably should have got it on a slide. Um, I got it for a friend, but I never actually got to send it. And, and, and it's, a, it's, it's a card and it has a little monkey with, you know, the monkey see, monkey here, monkey do. So it's a, a monkey see. And the card says, and then alcohol said, put that on Facebook, <laughs> but alcohol was wrong, so very wrong. <laughs> so I thought, I, I, I do need to send that card to my friend. Anyway. OK, so we're going to start off with the perils of social media. So this goes into my um, confession, because some of these people I don't actually even know. Um, and some of them I probably don't know because I really don't care. Um, I don't know whether you can read it or not, but there's some really profound and just not nice views there. Um, the one word I could describe, um, I'd like to describe each slide, but for this one, the one word is the consequences. And I'm sharing it with you because of the consequences. Um, so as you can see, this slide contains some tweets sent by Ollie Robinson and apparently years ago. The consequences are that he was given an eight game ban. I don't know whether that's good or bad. What, you get paid like not to play? Um, and he got a fine of 3,200. Um, but that really, I think, started the kind of, if I can put it in this way, the snowball effect. You know, like that snowball when it starts to pick up size and speed and goes downhill. Um, I think that started and we got to 2021. And for those of you who are interested in all of these type of things, there's a lot of sports related um, inappropriate social media comments. Um, and often they would refer to historic comments from eight, nine years ago. Um, and they resulted in suspensions and reprimands. Um, some of them would um, result in um, criminal proceedings. Someone got an 18-month suspended sentence. 
Um, I don't know about you, perhaps maybe I am showing my age, but when I was at school, I was told by my mother and my father that sticks and stones may break your bones, but words will never harm you. It's really interesting that people are now going to prison for things they say, but then I hear about terrible things that happen in society, like an elderly person being beaten up and then the person doesn't go to prison at all. So I'm kind of, I don't really understand what's going on. But consequences, you can go to prison. Um, someone even had to go on a 30 days rehabilitation uh, uh, work and training on um, racism and diversity. I just think if you hold those views, um, which are so inappropriate, I'm not sure how training is going to help you, but that's potentially one consequence. And of course, there's uh, employment consequences as well, and I'll, I'm going to pick up on those in the next few slides. So, Twitter, viral tweets. So, the catchword for this slide is speed. It's like trying to catch a, a greyhound. So this particular si slide, as you can see, is the UK Civil Service. Um, something to do with lockdown and Dominic Cummings' um, trip to, to, to Durham. Um, and this is the bit that's fascinating. It was retweeted 32,000 times. It made it on national press. But it was deleted 12 minutes, minutes after it was sent. I mean, that's just, that's just mind-blowing. I also understand that there was a similar tweet with HMV. Apparently, HMV were carrying out um, dismissals of a large group of people, and people were tweeting about it. Um, they took it, it took them about 20 minutes to close it down. But apparently, in that 20 minutes, there were 70,000 people had forwarded the tweet. So. Yes, speed is of the essence. So now I just want to uh, touch upon um, Article 10, which is the right to freedom of expression. Um, I suppose the message here is don't think you are free to express yourself um, like it's some sort of constitutional right, like the Fifth Amendment in, in, in America. Um, that's absolutely sacrosanct. It's, it's not. Um, this example essentially is a reminder um, that if you are a statutory director, uh, you're a public officer, you're a councillor, you're a public servant like a, a police officer, you might be a trustee on a charity or a governor in a school, perhaps maybe a lawyer. <laughs> a doctor, accountant, if you're some sort of professional. Um, if you express comments or views or observations about your organization or the work that you do or your role, um, you do not have carte blanche to say what you think. And then just following up uh, on, um, again, freedom of expression. Um, Mr. Uh, Keeble um, attended a rally outside of Parliament, um, and it was in his own time. And he made some comments that were filmed and then were posted, but they were filmed and posted without his consent, and he didn't know about it. What's really, really important about this case um, is his comments were found not to be unlawful. They weren't criminal. They weren't libelous. They were not abusive. Um, and they were not upsult, insulting or obscene. Um, and his comments were not about work. Um, he was dismissed by his employer. Um, and he took an employment tribunal claim. And they um, essentially, he won his claim. Um, and I suppose the message, I think, in all of this is, because I've often seen it with clients, um, people put, put things on social media that people get quite worked up about and get quite emotional. My view is just take a deep breath, put your wrists under 
cold water or take a cold shower and just think really carefully about it because this is a really good example of where the decision to dismiss um, was just was just the wrong decision as I said in his own time not about work and none of the comments were um, 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 offensive or unlawful the other learning point from this is if you think someone's comments are offensive or you've interpreted it in a way that you think is inappropriate before you make the decision to dismiss you must put those views to the individual so you can hear what they have to say because that's that didn't happen in this particular case so it's a little bit like when i used to do my own advocacy in employment tribunal um, I couldn't possibly say in my legal submissions at the very end that someone wasn't telling the truth about something particular unless I had actually put it to the individual. So it's exactly the same principle. Okay. Um, this slide, uh, in a nutshell, is rather obvious. Uh, the lesson here is don't make derogatory comments about your employer, employer on social media, which I know is incredibly obvious. Um, so in this particular case, um, uh, is it Mr. Weeks uh, made comments asked by his employer to stop, uh, warned about the consequences if he continued. He decided he would just continue. Um, so they dismissed him. He took them to tribunal um, and um, he, of course, failed. Um, what's interesting is the employment tribunal said um, the employer was entitled to take steps to protect its reputation. So bad mouthing someone on social media, that person in that particular case was entitled to take steps to protect their reputation. Um, and now I just want to um, talk about something that's slightly different. Um, this is the case of uh, uh, Oumba and um, Michael Garrett Associates and Leicester Theatre. Um, I don't know whether any of you have read the book Colour Purple and or seen the film Colour Purple or had both. I preferred the book, by the way, um, as an aside. Um, so, Michael Garrett... Uh, were the agency, so that's respondent number one, and uh, Leicester Theatre were respondent number two. And basically, uh, Umba had um, um, been put forward to play Celia. Um, and in this particular uh, role, um, and in the book, uh, there's a relationship between two women. Um, one of the cast uh, members must have well, they must have stalked her in a way because they went on social media and found some really old social media where she had published her views, where she, thought, where she basically said that she thought um, homosexuality was sinful. Um, and that particular person then um, tweeted it uh, and then there was just a little bit of a, a media storm about it. Um, and all about Oumba's being a bit of a hypocrite. Um, basically what happened is the agency and theatre both, both, both essentially sacked her and she took them to tribunal and the tribunal said her beliefs about homosexuality were protected beliefs. They accepted that but then they went on to hold that she hadn't been discriminated against. And I just thought it would be useful just to pull out some of the, the tribunal um, findings. Um, and, and they're very much their focus. So for the second respondent, this is the theatre. They said the effect of adverse publicity from the, re, from the retweet, the cohesion of the cast, the audience's uh, um, at reception, the reputation of the producers, and this is quote unquote, the good standing and commercial success, close quote, of the production. They were all considerations as to why they didn't find for the claimant in that case. And in respect of respondent number one, that was the agency, the tribunal said, given the publicity storm, 
it threatened um, the agency's survival. They accepted that. So, um, I have something that's not on the slide because it came about two days ago. It's Higgs and Farmore School, and it went to the Employment Appeal Tribunal. Um, and in a nutshell, um, it was a claim that involved a claimant who had been dismissed for um, expressing um, uh, views uh, about gender. But one of the, I don't know whether any of you have been to tribunal. Um, in an unfair dismissal, it just tends to be an employment tribunal judge. But in discrimination claims, it's a little bit like a mini jury. There's always two lay people. One will be, tends to be from an HR background, so they tend to be pro-respondent, as in pro-employer. And the other person, uh, the other lay person tends to be from a trade union background, and so they tend to be pro-claimant. That's kind of the general concept. One of the lay people, um, the claimant found out, I think, after the employment tribunal claim, one of the lay people had um, put on a social media post indicating their opposition to um, the kinds of gender critical beliefs that the, the, the claimant had held. But I just thought it was interesting just to read out what the judge said in the um, Employment Appeal Tribunal. Um, <coughs> the judge commented that she drew no inference from the fact that the material that gave rise to the request for the recusal came to light after being discovered by those acting for it, well, it's, it's the claimant, instead of being disclosed by the lay person. Um, and then they went on to note that while it would have been preferable for the lay member to have proactively taken steps to ensure these matters were drawn to the attention of the parties, the lay member's fa failure to do so should not in itself suggest any additional cause for concern. And they then went on to say, in future, the appropriate course would be for a lay member to raise any potential issues of this nature uh, with the judge with whom they are sitting on the case in question. But it does suggest to me, well, then that doesn't apply to judges as well. So it almost feels like we're going down the American route where you will test your jury um, for their beliefs before, um, before they actually sit uh, and decide um, the outcome of, of a case. So WhatsApp, what's up with WhatsApp um, is my second session. Um, I said I was going to remind you of some shockers, so you're all sitting down, so hold tight. Um, so I'm going to start with um, the police. I'm going to start with them, but I'm, you're just, they're just going to keep coming because there's so much of it. Um, okay, so let's start off. Um, so this is about a mocked George, George Floyd murder on WhatsApp. Three of them were charged with it, um, and, and the charges were sending grossly offensive images on a public communications network. The trial is going to be on the 28th and 29th of this month. So I'm assuming once we've got over what's happening today, because um, we'll have weeks of it, well then probably this will probably come. So um, no doubt when you hear it, you'll, you'll remember this. Um, I suspect based on what you'll see next. Um, I think you'll agree with me, these, these um, two police officers and ex-police officer are probably going to go to prison. Um, I've put this one on because this is about jumping to conclusions and I'll explain why. Uh, and my advice about having a deep breath and a, and a cold shower. In 2020, a female senior police officer was dismissed for possessing an indecent image. Um, and she got 200 hours community service in addition to dismissal and, of course, losing her profession. Um, so the facts are that she and 17 other people were on a WhatsApp group and she received an unsolicited message, just one, but from her sister, which contained a child abuse video. The video had been circulated um, 
apparently in disgust, in the hope that those responsible for filming it could be identified. Um, it was never proven that the individual, this lady, uh, whether she had ever opened it. So what she's done is she's taken it uh, all the way through to the, appeal, the Police Appeals Tribunal in 2021, and um, they basically um, supported her and said she should never have been dismissed. She should have been given a final written warning. So a helpful, a helpful case indeed. So this is the one where I'm going to, I'm going to say quite shocking things, but it's just to really draw it home. So this is again to do with the police. It involved the Independent Office for Police Conduct. And it looked like there was about nine linked independent investigations and then some massive inquiry. But the inquiry found multiple concerning behavioural themes about the attitudes and behaviour of police officers that ran through the investigation. So bullying and aggressive behaviour. Um, I love this because we say this a lot in employment, banter. Banter used to excuse oppressive and offensive behaviours. Discrimination, toxic masculinity, misogyny and sexual harassment, challenging and reporting um, improper conduct. Um, and this is the bit that I found really shocking. So remember, this is police officers on WhatsApp. Some of the examples of the banter identified through this review are pretty extreme. So these are the examples. I would happily rape you. If I was single, I would actually hate fuck you. If I was single, I would happily chloroform you. One officer was referred to as McCrappy rape person. I mean, I just, I read it and I just thought, these are police officers. Um, there was also examples of comments mocking disabilities, religious beliefs, racist, homophobic um, comments as well. Um, the BBC reported in February of this year that of the 14 officers investigated, two were dismissed for gross misconduct and barred. God knows what they must have said if they were barred as well. Another two resigned. Several others faced disciplinary action. Um, and nine are still serving with the force. Um, and one is working as a contractor. Anyway, the other thing that I wanted to share with you, and this is the bit that I also found really shocking, was the, um, the IOPC um, issued some recommendations and I was really surprised by these recommendations because it does really feel that our society has gone quite, in, is it infanticide where we treat adults like children? They're saying that the police needed to have better policies and there needed to be better guidance. I'm like, you don't need guidance to know that you shouldn't even think these things, never mind put them in writing. Um, there's also, I think the issue with a lot of police officers as well is they have their, so they'll have their work mobiles, but it'll have WhatsApp on it and they actually do use it for work. But the problem is they're also using it personally with colleagues. So there's that kind of, that, that, that mixture. So the, the police are going to have to um, consider that. Um, the, the, the IOPC also recommended that they might want to use some other internal social media for, for police forces so they, they could actually speak to each other on the social media platform but i just thought well is anybody going to do that because it's quite clearly going to be monitored but anyway i don't think monitoring actually stops people who have these views so just when you thought you didn't have enough police there's more police okay so um i'll let you read it described as predatory, involved nine female colleagues, and either on Facebook or WhatsApp. And guess what? He was dismissed. And again, recent, uh, you probably did see this on the news. I definitely remember seeing it on the news. Ex-probationary police officer posts racist WhatsApp memes. 
he warned that he could face a jail sentence. Um, so if it's May 2022, I don't know when he's going to be going to court, but I suspect that will be in the newspapers as well. So not only does he lose his job, he goes to jail and he'll never ever be a police officer. But hey, serves him right then, doesn't it? If he has those views. Okay, so something a little bit lighter. Uh, this is um, to do really with private sector and it's to do with an injunction. Um, so the defendants were directors of the company. They had what I would call post-termination restrictions. Some of you might know it as restricted covenants. And they thought they were very clever because they set up a WhatsApp group and essentially rallied a group of people to try and leave with them. So we're, they were going to try and take half the company with them. Um, and um, they were going to set up a competing business. And I'm assuming if they did, the, the, the actual business itself is a Sakar, Sakarma Limited um, was a force, would, would, would have closed down. Um, the company issued an injunction and it was granted, and guess what saved the day? The WhatsApp messages. Um, you'll see the, the Phoenix, this is what they used, um, and the plan was disguised as, a, as, a, as a, some sort of championship with um, um, individuals deciding to enter or not. But I did think the Phoenix one was a little bit strange, because as a lawyer I always think of Phoenix as insolvency and a company coming back to life which in this particular case was we're going to destroy you and we're going to bring it back to life in our own company. But anyway, never mind. And then moving on to employment and um, wrongful dismissal. Wrongful dismissal is um, you dismiss someone, um, a, an employee, and you dismiss them without notice. And a wrongful dismissal claim is essentially a breach of contract claim. I'm suing you for my notice. So um, these people were dismissed without notice. Um, and the reason why is because of the WhatsApp group um, discovered on their old phone had pornographic images um, that likened it to a female colleague. So they were dismissed for gross misconduct. They tried to say that it had something to do with the shares. Um, I have no idea whether it did or didn't. Uh, but the judge accepted the um, employer's um, uh, reasoning. And it actually really made me think about conversations many years ago when I was cutting my teeth as a junior employment lawyer. Um, someone senior on the board, like the managing director, would say, um, I really, I've really fallen out with my sales director or my ops director or finance director, but I don't really have anything on them. What should I do? And I'd say, check their expenses because you'd always find people fiddling their expenses. The more they get paid, the more they fiddle their expenses. That seemed to me, and it just is really interesting, isn't it? All these years later, my advice now would be, check their WhatsApp, check their social media. So in other words, the lesson is, if you're very senior and people need to get rid of you, you need to be really squeaky clean in your social media because it could be used against you. Okay, uh, another um, employment tribunal claim. This basically is a WhatsApp group that was set up by an employee. Uh, he didn't want, um, and he invited loads of people to um, join it. Um, he didn't want a p one particular employee to join, and the reason why is because he spent the next, I think, 40 days or so just completely slagging this individual off, made personal comments, um, made comments about the working practices, etc. What's really important is the employee that um, was being bad-mouthed never saw the messages. That's really important. Um, so he was dismissed, um, and the Employment Tribunal um, said it was a fair dismissal. It didn't matter whether the person who was the subject of um, the, the bad-mouthing saw it or not. It was about the employer. They were entitled to say, you have failed, you have not met the standards that we expect of you, and your conduct amounts to bullying and harassment. So my very last section, monitoring and taking action. Um, 
perhaps maybe I am showing my age because I'm going to say something about a song that I really like and you're thinking, God, that's really old, Karen. Lily Allen, I think she's talking about hypocrisy and people taking coke and stuff like that. She's, it's, everyone's at it. And it feels like that with recruitment and social media. It feels like, to me, it's just my perception that everyone's at it. Um, I think the main considerations are data uh, protection and data processing. Um, what's the purpose? How are you doing it? Who's doing it? Are you actually storing it? Is it consistent? Um, and actually, is it relevant and useful? I think that's very much for you to determine um, and perhaps maybe keep under review and perhaps maybe have uh, an, an audit trail. Um, during employment, I don't think everyone is at it. I think it probably is a little bit uh, less consistent. Um, but the main things is everybody thinks about the content of the social media screening. And it's often about the amount. The fact that you're online for two hours when you're meant to be working, it's not about what's in it, it's about the amount. So that's a really important consideration. Um, and obviously, can the employer be identified um, by any of the um, messaging on the social media being uh, used? Um, it's also really helpful to um, know whether there's an internal policy and what the internal policy might say about usage and uh, the nature of the content. And obviously, the nature of the employee's role is really important. The more senior you are, the more um, serious it is. Again, content, does it re um, refer to the staff, customers, or business? Um, and again, who has access uh, to the content? So is it only a private, closed group, or is it publicly available? So all the considerations that need to be taken into account. OK, we are on the home stretch, I promise. Um, I just want to touch upon Article 8 now, the right to respect for private and family life, home and correspondence. Um, and essentially, uh, I suppose I could distill this to, you must have a policy. It must be well communicated. You must explain why you're monitoring. Um, you need to explain why you're monitoring and how you're monitoring. Um, is it random? And if it's random, how often? And if it's not random, if it's actually targeted, you'll need to consider um, who you're targeting. You probably need to keep a record of it, um, particularly for consistency purposes, also to ensure that there isn't any discrimination. And you probably also need to consider um, the implied duty of trust and confidence, because if people feel that they're being targeted and it's unfair, you might be walking into um, constructive dismissal territory. Um, you need to be explicit um, about your expectations and you need to be explicit about the consequences. Um, so for example, if you mark something personal or there's a personal part of your, you know, your, your outlook, then no, we won't look in it. But if you send personal emails on your normal emails, please don't assume that they'll never be read. Do you see what I mean? You, you need to use plain English, plain language. Um, just remember as well, small point, um, there's data protection issues because if you're going to monitor, my understanding is there's a statutory re regime governing interception of electronic communications. So you'll, you'll need to bear that in mind. And these are just three cases just to bring them to life. Um, Barbulescu, um, he had not been informed of monitoring, so the employer got it wrong. Uh, Gara Muka, Mukana Wa, um, the employer got it right because there was no expectation of privacy and in fact he had been put on notice. And in the last one, again a police one, um, no expectation of um, privacy. Um, the content in this particular case, I think what really resonated with me is the crime scenes, because I've actually seen this before, very early on in my career, where a police officer must have um, 
taken or used crime scene photographs on and then it went viral because I've seen it in, in, in employees' um, um, emails. Shocking stuff. Um, and of course, um, the senders were subject to professional standards on and off duty. Just because a police officer is off duty doesn't mean that he or she shouldn't um, meet the standards that society and their employer expects of a police officer. And I'm on the final slide. So, um, I always end on some, to, uh, on some top tips. So, um, it sounds really rather obvious, but have a policy on social media usage. I'm surprised how many people do not have a policy on social media usage um, and regularly update it because you might refer to WhatsApp now, but hey, WhatsApp might not even be around next year. Who knows? Um, ensure that the social media policy links appropriately to the disciplinary. This is one thing that I often find with clients. They've got lots of different policies, but none of them speak to each other. You just you kind of need to have the social media policy here and you need to have your discipline, disciplinary policy here. And then you need to make sure that the social media policy sets out what is considered to be absolutely unacceptable and or gross misconduct. And then you go to your gross misconduct section in your disciplinary policy and make sure that, that it's copied there. It seems really rather obvious, but I'm always really surprised when I get people's policies and I just think, right. OK. Um, include appropriate protections with the employment, employment contracts. I think this is really about confidentiality and no bad mouthing provisions. Um, the only thing that you just need to be aware of to make sure that it doesn't um, prevent whistleblowing. Um, PR, yeah, you always need to think about PR and being forewarned. Um, and do you remember that the, the viral tweets? It might also be worth speaking with your IT director or IT to find out what would you do if that ever happened? Would you be able to lock it down? Um, and then the suggestion here is carry out some exit interviews. Um, the view is that aggrieved uh, employees might essentially give you the heads up. And if you've got the heads up on it, you might be able to have some pre-prepared um, PR uh, and put yourself in the best position to be able to uh, respond to it. Um, and I wasn't going to show you this, but I thought it was funny. It's me. <laughs> I, I look completely different, and I just like to say, this is two years of lockdown hair. I think it's amazing. So, there's definitely a delay. Thank you. You're going. <laughs> Karen, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so that brings it to a close.